1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and we're going to pick up our reading in verse number 9, and we're going to read down through verse number 17. And I want to say at the outset of this, this is the most difficult thing that I could ever do in my life as a preacher is, is just jump into the middle not only of a book, but inside the middle of a chapter. And so we're going to do something very special today. I'm going to plan on preaching about five hours long so we can deal with the... Yeah, some of you, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we're, we're not going to do that. But of course, we are, we are jumping right into the middle of not only a, a book of the Bible, but in the middle of a, of a chapter, in the middle of a thought that's going on. So we'll try to lay some groundwork here. So let's begin reading in verse number 9. Uh, Paul writes, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Now, that's not us, and that's not talking about us. That's talking about Paul the Apostle, okay? And so, as a wise master builder, Paul says, I have laid the foundation. And that was the work of the apostles. According to Ephesians 2, they laid the foundation. They were not the foundation, but they laid the foundation. Uh, So, Paul says, I laid the foundation, and another buildeth their own. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. And and the day there is the judgment seat of Christ." Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, Verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let's pray one more time together, okay? Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray now that you would just open our our eyes, our, our ears, our hearts. Teach us by your spirit your word, and just transform our lives. I pray for those that are not saved here today, um, little little children maybe teenager, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, whoever they may be. God, I I pray that you would work in them and on them and through them. And according to your will, draw people to be saved. And and Father, I pray for those of us that have been saved. Primarily, uh, God, that's that's what the church is here for, uh, for for you to give us instruction from your word. And I pray that you do that now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, So I want to preach this morning from this passage on careful construction, okay? Uh, and, and I do know a, a couple of things about construction, and that is not a prideful statement. I want to clarify that statement, okay? Uh, I, I know a little bit about construction. What I mean by that is I do understand that there are at least two categories of people who construct, people who, who build things, okay? Uh, there are, number one, there are people who build things, okay? And then, number two, there are builders, Okay. I would I would place myself personally in the first category. I'm one of the people who build things. That's not a good thing, okay? Uh what, what I mean by people who build things is I'm I'm a I'm a I'm the kind of guy I know how to use a saw, I know how to use a hammer, I know how to use a drill. I can I can screw things together, I can nail things together. You, you know you're not even in one of the categories if you say hammer things together, okay? I know how to nail things together. I'm, I'm like in that first category of, of people. I don't call every circular saw a skill saw. Yeah, okay? That's a brand. That's not a... I know, ladies, just hold on. We'll get to you in a minute, okay? But it's a circular saw. It's not... Uh, we, we grew up every every circular saw is a skill saw. And that's that's still what my family... Like, like I know when I'm around my family, don't say circular saw because they're, they're like... Ugh. You have to say skill saw. And they, they know what it is. It doesn't matter if you have t- 12 saws that are skill. Are y'all having fun yet? Okay. Man, it's so easy to go off on that stuff. Okay. I'm a person that builds. Here's what I mean by that. I have no idea what the structure is going to be to get from point A to point B. I just start 
I, like I cut things, I measure things, I nail things, I, I, I use screws to put, fasten things together, and, and I will encounter problems along the way, and I'll just take things back apart and cut them shorter or get new boards and make them longer and just kind of fix it. And the end result usually is, is pretty good. Like I've, I've built some things and, and, and like only three people have died going inside of them. Like it's worked out thus far. It's, I'm, a, I'm a person who builds things. But there are builders in this world. And, and you may be one of them. And, and builders know how to build. Like from, from the word go, like, like they've already got the blueprint in their head. They've already, they've already thought through every challenge. They fixed it before they got to it. And it just runs smoothly. Like, like typically if I'm building a building, I'm good with the, with the floor, the walls. But when I get to the roof and like the, the, the eaves and like, it's just, it's just not a pretty thing. Okay. So, so with my experience as a person that builds, I at least understand this. Okay. You have, if you're building something, you have to build carefully or you're probably not going to build correctly. Like, I'm pretty sure I've never built anything according to code in my entire life, okay? Um, it works, but it's probably not as good as the builder could build it, okay? And so construction needs to be done carefully. We could say it a little bit differently, that if, if you're going to build, you have to build carefully, or you're probably not going to build it right. It, it has to be careful construction. And that's what we're going to look at here from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The, the idea of building carefully, of paying attention to what we're doing, not, not as we're building shelters or barns or houses or whatever, but as we're building our lives, we need to be very careful how we are building our lives. Okay, so we're in 1 Corinthians, and the book, the, the larger you know scope here, the entire book of 1 Corinthians is actually a book that is dedicated to the idea of correcting the behavior of people who call themselves Christians, okay? Uh, First Corinthians is, is about a group of people who have professed to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been accepted into the membership of the church at Corinth, but by and large, the membership of this church is really struggling in their moral behaviors. In fact, we're not going to deal with it, but if you would read through First Corinthians, you would you would be shocked by some of the things that these people were doing in just their day-to-day -day lives and still calling themselves Christians. Like it is, it is really troubling some of the things that they were, that they were doing. And so the book of 1 Corinthians is Paul writing to this church saying, Hey, it's not right the way that you guys are behaving. Or if you will, you're not building your lives correctly. You're not being as careful as you should be. In the smaller context here of chapter 3, Paul is pushing these believers to develop into Christian maturity, okay? So, so here's the idea. In fact, if you look at it, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says that, that he is speaking to individuals that ought to be spiritual. And, and the idea is spiritually mature, okay? Uh, but they're not. In, in other words, here's a group of people who have been saved for a significant period of time. These aren't new converts. They're behaving maybe like new converts, but they're not new converts. They, they've been saved years. They are years into their Christian faith. And so Paul says, when I'm writing unto you, I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Notice the expression, even as unto babes in Christ. And the problem again here is that you are behaving like Christian babies, but you're not. You are way beyond that in terms of years, and so you should be beyond that in, uh, in, in the case of your maturity. So in chapter 3, Paul is pushing these believers to come out of spiritual infancy and to grow into spiritual maturity. And, and here's kind of the over, overarching uh, a theme of his push to maturity. Spiritual, or, or, or just children in general, really, children in general do not think about the future. Agreed, right? Like, like some of you are thinking like, I must be a child, <laughs> right? Uh, children, children typically don't think about the future. They don't think about consequences. Like they don't think at 6 o'clock and you're eating supper at 6.15, they don't think about supper coming. They want the snicker bar now. They, they don't think about, they don't think 15 minutes in the future, much less of like, like there's probably not many 
five-year-olds that are thinking about what career options that they want. There's not many folks in junior high that are thinking, I need to maintain a certain GPA because of the college and career choices that I'm, that I'm going. They're not thinking 401K. They're not thinking retirement plans. Children just typically don't think about the future. And that's fine. You're a child. You don't, you don't, you don't have to think about that. But eventually, maturity ought to kick in. And the older we get, the more mature we become, we start thinking in terms of the future. Okay, spiritually, what Paul is saying to these individuals is you are not thinking about the future. Point in case, you're not thinking about the decisions that you're making right now. They've got consequences attached to them. You know, like... Like whatever bad decisions they're making, bad decisions carry bad consequences. You reap what you sow. Spiritual children don't think about that, okay? They're, they're immature. They're just thinking about the pleasure of sin for a season. They're not thinking about the consequences. Much less, they're not thinking in terms of eternity. They're not thinking in terms of there's a judgment seat of Christ and the decisions that I'm making right now and the words and my thoughts and my actions and my motives and everything that I, all the decisions that I'm making right now, I'm going to be held accountable for those things as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ one day at the judgment seat of Christ. Spiritual children don't think like that. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 is trying to push them, pull them rather, out of spiritual immaturity into spiritual maturity where they're starting to think in terms of I'm going to be held accountable for how I, how I have behaved myself as a child of God. Now, just, just one more kind of introductory thought here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We also learn here in this chapter, and this is huge to the entire book of 1 Corinthians. It, it, it really started back in chapter number 1. But, but here, particularly in chapter 3, we do learn who the church actually belongs to. And, and this is true of the early church, the Middle Ages. This is true of the modern day church. Who does the church actually belong to? Well, in Paul's terminology here in chapter 3, the, the church doesn't belong to him. It doesn't belong to Paul. And the church doesn't belong to Apollos. The church doesn't even belong to Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost. The, the church doesn't belong to culture. It doesn't belong to the pastor. And it doesn't belong to the deacons. The church actually belongs to God, because the church is the creation of God. It is God who started the church, and therefore the church belongs to Him. Now that's important as we move forward this morning, because everything that goes into the building up of the church, if we're going to do it right, if we're going to carefully construct our lives as the church, we're going to have to do it God's way. Because it's God's church, and therefore we need to do things God's way. Now, there are, there are two, as we come into our text, verse number 9, Paul immediately identifies the church by using two analogies. These are important. Verse number 9, we are laborers together with God. Notice this, ye are God's husbandry, and ye are God's building. You're God's husbandry. That, that's a word, literally, it translates into you're God's field, or you're God's farm, if you will. So you're, you're God's husband, you're, you're his field, you're his farm, you are his building is the second analogy. Both of those expressions refer again to development. A field or a farm is something that has to be cultivated, it has to be plowed, it, it has to be fertilized, it has to be tended to, and, and it, so, so property is being developed, but why? Because we want progress in, in the, in the form of fruit. We, we want something to actually grow out of our investment into the property. And, and then the, the idea of a building. A building is also something that is being developed. Again, in Ephesians 2, Paul uh, uh, deals with this topic a little bit uh, where he talks about the building of God, the temple of God, being fitly framed together. It's the idea of development where we are, where we are growing, okay? Where we are maturing. We're getting beyond the, the mere basics of the Christian life and we're going on into maturity. Now, now in chapter 3, Paul is not going to go on to deal with the idea of us being God's farm. He is rather going to enlarge upon the analogy that you and I as believers are a are the building of God, or if you will, as we get uh, later over into this thing, we are the, specifically, we are the temple of God. What kind of building are we where we are a holy building? We're not a recreation center. 
This isn't the boys and girls club. Okay, this is the, the, the building of God is the temple of God. And that's significant because the building of God is a place that is dedicated to worship. It's not dedicated to fun. It's not dedicated to just, to just relaxing or whatever, but it's a place that is dedicated to the actual service of God. Now, Paul says something very incredible here in verse number nine, uh, as, as far as this building of God is concerned at the beginning of verse number nine. He says, we, and, and the, the noun we lumps us all in together. And Paul says we, even, even these carnal, spiritually immature believers, Paul says we are laborers together with God. We are literally, uh, the, we are literally working together with God. We participate with God in the construction of our lives. Just two theological words that I'm going to throw out to you uh, real quick. One of them is monergenistic. That's a, that's a big word that makes you sound like you know a lot. All it means is, is that there's, there's one person involved. Okay, Like when we say monotheism, we're worshiping one God, not a plurality of God. Monergenistic is, is a word that we apply to salvation. And what we mean by that is that God alone is the author of salvation. We haven't contributed to our own salvation. So salvation is a monergenistic work of God. He's, he's taking care of it all by himself. There is a, another word, uh, synergistic, okay? And, 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 and that word is actually derived from verse number nine. Synergistic is something, as you might, uh, 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 assume, uh, S-Y-N, the, the, the prefix there, is working together. After salvation, you and I, because of our salvation, are now set free. The Spirit of the Lord has brought liberty in our lives. Liberty not to sin, but liberty to serve. We're now, because, because we're saved, we can now cooperate with the Spirit of God, which is something we couldn't do prior to salvation because we were completely alienated from God. So because we're saved, now Paul says, we work together with God. We're not opposing God. We were before we got saved, but now God has reconciled us and we're able to work together with God. God. Okay. And so labor together. We are literally work companions with God. And so New Testament terminology really is neat. Uh, we're, we're not so much working for God. I, I'm not opposed to that. And, and that definitely is uh, encapsulated in the idea of us being a servant or a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not so much that the stress of New Testament theology is not so much on the fact that you and I are serving uh, or working for God. But it's rather, the emphasis is rather on the fact that you and I are working with God. We're co-laborers together with the Lord. Now, now as, as working companions with God, building this building of God, the temple of God, there is a huge admonition that's given to us at the latter part of verse number 10. I want you to notice it with me. I've got it highlighted actually in my Bible. The last sentence of verse number 10, here's what Paul says. But let every man take heed. Let every man be careful how he buildeth thereupon. You and I are building on the foundation that, that Paul and the other apostles have laid, which is the foundation of Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of the church. He is the foundation of the believer's life. And now we are building. And, and by the way, all of us are building, okay? You're either a person who builds or you're a builder. You're either doing a, a real good job or probably doing a real bad job. But all of us are building. And so Paul encourages us as believers to be careful how you are building on this foundation, which begs the question, how should I build my life? Now, what does it mean to be careful in the construction of my life? Okay, in the construction of my life. How should I meticulously and carefully and correctly build the story, if you will, of my life? And that's what we want to deal with uh, at, at length here today. So here's the first thing that we want to look at. Number one, if you're taking notes, jot down. Uh, if, if we're going to carefully build our lives, the, the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that we are building on the right foundation. You need to build on the right foundation. Would you look with me again back in verse number 10? Paul says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Uh, in other words, here is the, here is the main contractor on the job. Okay. 
Here, here's the man that everybody else is supposed to listen to. Paul says, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And, and you, another, someone else, other people, it's going to be their responsibility to build on the foundation. Now, what is the foundation that has already been laid? Verse number 11. Further foundation can no man lay than that, with, that, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul says Jesus Christ is the only right foundation for the church, and therefore Jesus Christ is the only right foundation for your individual life. Okay, The word foundation refers to a substruction. It's what the structure is going to be built on. And so the idea is that if you don't have the right foundation, it doesn't matter how elegant of a building you construct, if you don't have the right foundation, you have nothing. Okay, So your life needs to be built on Jesus Christ. Foundations are absolutely important. Okay, uh, when, when we were building the, the, the building over here next door, uh, our fellowship building several years ago, uh, our, our contractor encouraged us, and I think he was, I think he was really smart, Mr. Tony Barr. He did a, a wonderful job. And, and when you, when you pull in to our parking lot here, uh, you've noticed, and I've, look, we're going to have to put up a speed limit sign. I mean, some of you guys, wow. <laughs> Man, I mean, but I see you, and it's not, I'm not worried about you hitting kids. That's fine. I mean, we're not, you know, we've got insurance. But I'm worried about the shocks on your car. I mean, do you not feel it? It's like you're just like, whoo, whoo, whoo. And you get back here and the, and the concrete's cracked and some of it's falling in. And so you better be careful about rebellion because the sons of Korah and God, and that may happen to you. I don't know, okay? All right? Uh, what happened with construction? I've been, I've been told that, that, that some of you men help do that out there. And you're people that build. You're not builders. Okay? You didn't do the proper work that's needed for a foundation. <laughs> okay, so our contractor, Mr. Tony, told us, he said, hey, the reason why you have that is because there's holes up underneath the ground. There's uh, trees maybe used to be there or rocks or whatever. And so you don't see it and you pack it down. But over time, what's going to happen is the concrete's going to start to settle more and more. So when we built this building over here, we spent 7000 extra dollars to hire this big-time corporation to come in. And as they, were, as they were bringing all this dirt in, they would come out and test it at various levels to make sure that it was packed in. Why? Because it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter about a $500,000 building if you don't have the right foundation and it starts, the foundation starts to crumble. It doesn't matter. A foundation is so, so important. Okay, so what foundation is the church to be built on? Okay, well, the, the foundation of the church is, is not history, and it's not tradition, and it's not moral standards, and it's not the apostles, and it's not the prophets, and it's not, not the preachers. Again, the foundation is Jesus Christ, period. That's it. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 6, Peter refers to Jesus not only as the foundation, but he refers to Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Like every building has that one corner that all the other corners are going to be laid out from, okay? And, and Peter says, Peter says, that's Jesus Christ. Everything else is measured by him. If we're off when we get over here, we go back to the chief cornerstone. We go back to him to see, hey, where did we get off track? When we look through 2,000 years of church history and the church has got off track, we, we, don't, just, we don't just go back to, to a, a previous church history. We don't just go back to, well, what did this guy say or that guy say? No, we want to go back to the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Now, now there's two implications that kind of come out of this building with the right foundation. The first one deals with the church as a whole, what we would call ecclesiology, okay? So, so the church as a whole, like if we were to look at Fellowship Baptist Church, uh, in, in regards to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, we would, we would walk away saying that Jesus Christ must be the foundation of Fellowship Baptist Church. He has to be. It's not, it's not fellowshipping. It's not a particular family. It's not economics. It's not the, the foundation of Fellowship Baptist Church has to be nothing else other than Jesus Christ. Meaning, everything stems from Him and everything revolves around the person of Christ. Again, not culture, not pragmatism, not, uh, we, we don't make decisions here at Fellowship Baptist Church based off what's working in other parts of the world or in other churches. We're not, we're not polling the lost world saying, hey, what do you think we ought to do at church? No, no, we're not, we're not, uh, 
We're not building a church based on felt needs. Uh, it's, it's built, in, in fact, again, verse number 11 is very emphatic. There is no other foundation that can be laid. There, there's, there's not even like option B here. He's not even given the, 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 the potential idea of there being something else. No, no, the church as a whole is to be built on Jesus Christ. Now, now that's, that's the church as a whole. That's ecclesiology. But there is definitely a huge pull by the apostle for us personally as individual members of the local church known as Fellowship Baptist Church. I want to, I want to point this out to you because honestly, there, there is a lot to say about the church as a whole. And if we were at a pastor's conference, we might, we might preach it more along those lines. But there is a huge emphasis here on your life and my life as individual believers. Notice with me, I think it's seven times we're going to notice through the courses of verse 10 through verse number 17 where Paul is going to use the expressions. There's two expressions. He's either going to say every man or any man. Okay, so notice that verse number 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build it thereupon, but let every man, verse number 12, now if any man, verse 13, every man's work, uh, at the end of verse number 13, and the fire shall try every man's work, verse number 14, if any man's work, verse 15, if any man's work, again, verse number 17, if any man defile the temple of God. Paul has as an emphasis the individual person inside the local church. Okay, so, so Paul's a church man. He loved the church at Corinth. He had ministered to the church at Corinth. This isn't even Paul's first letter, even though we read in our Bible it's the first letter. It's the first inspired text. But Paul had many interactions with the church at Corinth up, up to this point. And Paul's desire was to see the church flourish and grow with Jesus Christ as its, as its foundation and then to go on into Christian maturity. Paul wants the church as a whole to do that. But Paul understands a very key principle that the church as a whole is only as strong as the church as an individual is. So Fellowship Baptist Church is only as strong, really, as your family is. And the church of Fellowship Baptist Church is only as strong, not only as your family is, but only as strong as you as an individual believer are. This is where it starts at. That's why D.L. Moody, I believe it was D.L. Moody, uh, said that he drew, uh, drew a circle and he stepped inside of the circle and he said, Lord, send revival inside of the circle. He understood that it started on an individual level, okay? So every man, any man speaks of us as individuals. So, so, so here's some questions, Dion, that we could just kind of throw out at us. Is your life, not, not your wife, not, not your parents, not your pastor, not your church, but you as an individual, is your life built on Jesus Christ? Is He where your life starts? Is He what your life starts with? Is He the support of your life? Is your life resting on Jesus Christ? Does your life revolve around Jesus Christ in the sense that when you get over there to that other corner and things aren't going right, do you trace your steps back to where He is? What is the governing principle of your life? By, by the way, uh, here inside of... Uh, here inside of verse number 10, where he says, Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. The word, the word buildeth is in the present act, act, uh, active indicative, meaning this is a continuous action. This is something that you are constantly concerning yourself with. That Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that I haven't changed foundations. I'm making sure that I haven't, that I haven't exchanged Christ as my foundation for popularity, for worldly prestige. For, for an acceptance among my peers, for worldly philosophies. I want to make sure that I haven't pushed Christ to the side and put Hollywood as the foundation of my life. No, 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 no. The only right foundation for my life and for your life is to make sure that we have Jesus Christ as our foundation. That means that you have acknowledged your sins. It means that you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have believed on Him, that you have pledged your life, that you have submitted yourself to Him to serve Him and to live for Him and to love Him as He has loved us and given Himself for us. Your life will never be right unless it is built on Jesus Christ. It'll never be right. It'll never be right. It doesn't matter what you accomplish. It doesn't matter how beautiful the building is. On the day of judgment, in the future... 
If your life's not built on Jesus Christ, what would it profit a man to have gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Here's the second thing this morning. Number two, if we're going to build carefully in our lives, we need to have the right foundation. Number two, we need to use the right materials. We need to use the right materials. This begins verse number 12. Now if, notice again, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, the judgment seat of Christ, because it's going to be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work. This is important of what sort it is. See, as, as believers, there are different kinds of works, different kinds of conduct or behavior that we have as believers. When you got saved, maybe it was last week, last month, last year, last decade, last century, okay? When you got saved, God didn't like flip this switch in your life where He's just automatically just tickled pink about everything, every decision that you make. Just because you're saved doesn't mean everything you do now pleases God. No, no, instead, now that you're saved, you have the ability to be able to please God. But you don't have the guarantee that your life is pleasing God. And so it's important for us to make sure that our works are the right sort or they are the right kind. Okay, so every builder has to have materials in order to build with. Like I think all of us get that. Like even if you're not a builder, like you got that, right? Like you have to have materials. Every builder has to have materials to work with. So in verses, in, well actually inside of verse number 12, we are given a listing for our choice of materials as we build our lives. Verse number 12, we have gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. There's two categories here. I think we would do wrong to divide it up into six different uh, categories here. There's, there's two categories. You have, you have the better building choices, the correct building choices of gold, silver, precious stone, and then you have the inferior building materials. You have, you have the wrong kind of building materials, which is wood, hay, stubble. Note that it is possible for you to have the right foundation and use the wrong building materials. Okay, So we have gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. Again, there's no distinction inside of these two groups. The two are just opposed to each other. You are either, as a believer, with the right foundation of Jesus Christ in your life, you're either building with gold, silver, and precious stones, or you are building with wood, hay, and stubble. Now, what do, what, what do these items speak of? Let's, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist preacher. Let's start negatively. What do these items not represent? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, they do not represent your wealth. They do not represent your talent, and they do not represent your opportunity. Those are things beyond your control in, in certain regards, okay? Uh, God, has, God has exalted you, maybe. God has, God has allowed you to climb the scales where He has not allowed that in other people. If you're, if you're a more well-off person today, uh, you, you have nothing to pat yourself on the back about. Uh, there's no, there's no self-made man here today. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights in whom there's neither variableness, neither shadow of turning. And so God has prospered you in that way. And so your wealth, your talent, your opportunity, those are things outside of your control. And therefore, in, in so many regards, those are things that you're not necessarily going to be judged by, by, by what you have been able to actually acquire. So what do these items actually represent? They, they specifically then represent our response to what we have been given. You may not be able to determine how much money you have in the bank or, or how much money you make, but you can determine what you do with your wealth. Okay? Uh, you, 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 you probably couldn't determine or you couldn't determine the amount of natural talent or ability you were given at birth but you can determine what you do with that sort of talent or natural ability. You can determine what you do with certain opportunities. I mean, they're just gifts of God, God opening doors for you to walk through. But you could determine what you do with those opportunities that you are given. And God's going to judge us on those things. He's going to judge us based all from everything that He has given. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, he says that we are to be good stewards of the manifold grace of 
of God. By grace there, he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about the gifts that God has given to us. The manifold, the varied graces is how we would say it. That God has given to us. Okay, God has given so much. And the reality is he's given things to you that he hasn't given to me. He's given wealth to you that maybe he hasn't given to me. And he's given to you uh, talents that he hasn't given to me. And he's given to you opportunities that he hasn't given to me. And the same can be said vice versa. We can't control those things, but I am to control and to be wise about how I use the resources that God has placed within my grasp. Now, one of the, one of the very enlightening things that we learn about from Scripture is that when God judges us eventually. And by the way, God is going to judge all of us based on this premise of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He's going to judge us based off the building materials that we're using in our lives as the church of Jesus Christ. Something very interesting is that when God does judge us, He's not judging us on quantity as much as He is judging us off a percentage basis. Percentage, okay? Like if you don't give 10%, you're not going, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. That's not, that's not, okay? God judges us all percentage. We don't have time to go to the text, but if you want to mark down Matthew chapter 25, and there's a series of kingdom parables that Jesus has given in Matthew 25. One particular parable that Jesus gives in Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. You remember that? Now, the word talents there doesn't refer to natural ability. It's it's actually a, a monetary term, okay? And so uh, in that parable, Jesus says that a man is going to give certain talents to three different individuals. To one individual, he gives five talents. To another individual, he gives two talents. And to the third individual, he just gives one talent. So one man has five, one man has two, one man has one. The man who gives the talents goes away, and he has made it very clear when he returns, he expects them to have used. Now, now they couldn't determine what they were given, but they were to determine to make a profit out of what he had given. And, and, and the master, the man of the house, made that very clear to them before he left that they were to utilize the resources they had been given. Well, the man goes away. There's an extended period of time. And when he comes back, indicative of the judgment of Christ for the believer... Here's what, here's what Christ finds. Uh, here's, here's what the master finds. He finds that the man who was given five talents worked real diligently and he gained five more talents. So, so what's five plus five? Yeah, yeah, ten. Wow, good job. Wow. Okay, ten talents. He has ten talents now. The man who had, had been given two talents, he worked very diligently and he got two more talents. And so he has four talents now. But the slacker who only got one talent didn't do hardly anything. In fact, he did nothing. He just kind of dug a hole, buried his talent, and he told the man, there you have what is, what is yours. Okay. He did nothing with it. Here's, here's what I want to draw your attention to. The first two guys, the one that had five, made five more, he's got ten. The second guy who had two, and he added two to it, and he's got four. Did you know the same exact commendation was given to those men? The one who now had ten wasn't praised above the one who only had four. He could only, he could only, do, he did 100% with what he had. And the other guy did 100%. See, God, God, God's telling us he, he judges based off percent. You may not accomplish necessarily what somebody else accomplishes. Don't worry about that because God hasn't necessarily given you the resources to do that. What you are called to do is use what resources God has given to you to the very best of your ability. So to the guy who now has 10 and the guy who now has 4, here's what the master says. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. To both of them. It's the one who had gotten the one talent. Listen, if he'd have just, if he'd have given 100%, he only would have had two at the end of the day, but he couldn't even give that kind of work effort to it. And so God is displeased with a man who doesn't utilize, he doesn't use what has been given to him properly in the way that he should have actually used it. Okay, so there's there's two important expressions here uh, concerning our using of the right materials in our life. Two very important expressions, and, and we need to we need to know this as believers. This is so relevant to our lives. The first expression comes to us in verse number 14, and it is the expression, receive a reward. You see that at the very end of verse 14, Paul says, if any man's work abide, 
meaning he is built with precious stones, silver, or gold. He has, he has used the right works, the right materials, if you will, in his life. If he has done that, then in verse number 14, such a man receives a reward. In other words, believers who work constructively with what our Lord has given to us are praised and given an appropriate reward for what, for what we were supposed to do. Now, God is going to reward us a, a promised reward for building our lives the way God has intended for us to do. Isn't that amazing, church? I mean, as believers, like, like it's not enough that God has forgiven us of our sins, has removed the potential of hell from us, has put us into His family and guaranteed an eternity in heaven with Him. But He has added to this the concept of us receiving rewards based upon us just building our lives, which by the way has benefit here as well as into eternity. God's promised that. Here's, here's how one Bible teacher uh, responded to this. He said, when a pastor preaches sound, solid doctrine, he is building constructively. When a teacher teaches the Word consistently and fully, he is building with good materials. When a person with the gift of helps spends himself serving others in the Lord's name, he is building with materials that will endure testing and will bring great reward. When a believer's life is holy, submissive, and worshipful, he is living a life built with precious materials. This is the idea, this is the concept that Christ gives to us that we will receive a reward. Notice the second expression, though, found inside of verse number 15, and, and it comes uh, about midway. It's the expression, suffer loss. Now listen to what Paul says here, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned. In other words, he used, instead of gold, silver, and precious stones, he uses wood, hay, stubble. Stubble is like straw, okay? He uses inferior building materials. If any man's work shall be burned by the fire of judgment or testing, he shall suffer loss. Here's the reality. So much of what believers actually involve themselves in, or, or if you will, their lack of involvement, will cause them to forfeit rewards when we get to heaven. Because we're too distracted by the play pretty things of this world. And we are, we are, we are just, we have we, we derailed ourselves, and we're going after every other earthly pursuit rather than seeing God as the goal of our life, and Jesus Christ as the foundation of our life, and us dedicating ourselves into His service. Well, well, for the person who gets sidetracked, and instead of serving God, he serves self, and instead of wanting God's applause, he wants the world's applause. Instead of, instead of wanting uh, to sing the praises of God, he wants the praises of man saying, to him, such a person, Paul says, is a person who at the judgment seat of Christ is going to suffer loss. Now that's real and that's right. But here's, here's a test for you to be able to judge whether you are a mature believer or an immature believer. Mature believers, they hear that and they say, oh man, I better shape up and put things right in my life. Immature believers, if you are a believer, say, oh yeah, well, no biggie, I'm not changing anything because you fail to grasp the concept of the future and how important the day of judgment really is going to be. Such a man, in verse number 15, who suffers loss is like a man who has, I mean, he has just grabbed everything he can. He's thrown things around his neck. I mean, he's got things like, like he's, I mean, he's just like toting everything he can. I mean, he's grabbed literally everything he can hold. But in order to get inside, he has to pass through the fire. And so he passes through. But once he gets on the other side, everything he was trying to hold on to has been burned. And all of his life's pursuits have been lost in a moment. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. So how do we build using the right materials in our life? Let me give to you three things here and we'll move on. Number one, you need to check our motives. We need to check our motives. We, we build our lives carefully. We build our lives correctly. 
by making sure that our motives are right. Here, here's what I mean. I, I'm preaching to a church crowd this morning, right? Y'all are, you're, you're the church crowd. You're here. There's folks that aren't here. You're the church crowd. So you came to church for, for you know, right. You, you're here. Praise the Lord. And some of you sing in the choir. And some of you taught Sunday school classes. And, and, and some of you, you know, played uh, instruments and, 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 and whatever you've done. And you picked up trash. And some of you cleaned buildings. And some of you helped clean up after a, after a marriage meeting last night. And, and, and there's things that you're involving yourself in. Some of you teach children on, on Wednesday nights. And, and, and you lead youth choirs. And, and there's all these things that we're doing. You're the church crowd. That's great, right? I mean, I'm... I'm really building with gold, silver, and precious stones. But not, not necessarily. So it's not just what we're doing as believers, but it's why. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? In fact, just one chapter over chapter 4 in verse number 5, Paul says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest, here, here's the expression, the counsels of the heart. The motives of the heart. Not just what I have done. See, that's how we judge. We, we judge. We come to church and say, oh man, we had a good crowd of folks. And man, the choir sang great. And the musicians played, I mean, beautiful. And that was right. And this was right. And the sound guy and this guy and that girl and that gal. And, and everything was just right. And while God's judging, He's not judging on that. God's, God's looking at every individual. And He's saying, man, why are you doing? The things. You know, some folks sing in the choir. I, I, we could preach right here. Some folks sing in the choir because they have something to offer and they want you to know it. Yeah, you're going to lose that. They think they're God's gift. <laughs> Musicians can think that. Sunday school teachers can think that. Pastors can think that. Like, like I'm just, shit, shit. Y'all, you're so blessed. You're so blessed to have me. No, why are we doing it? So check our motives. Here's, here's the second way we can build with the right materials. Monitor our conduct. Monitor our conduct. What are you using your time and your energy for? What are you doing with your life? Like, like if you were to just, I know it's analytical. I, I, I know it's maybe beyond us. But, but spiritual inventory is a good thing. And to make regular routine examinations of your life. Like God forbid you go to, to the doctor to get a physical and to the dentist to get a, a checkup and, and, and x-rays. And God forbid you do all of those things. But you never sit down with the Bible and examine your spiritual relationship with God. You know? So, so let's do that. Like what are you doing in your life for God? When is the last time you actually opened a Bible and read it? I mean, not in church, not in Sunday school, not in some Bible study, but just open the Bible and say, I esteem the words of your mouth more than my necessary bread. When's the last time you prayed? I mean, just, just, just got in your prayer closet, not some quick, now lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. When's the last time you actually got a hold of God and expressed the burdens on your heart? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, what's your, when's the last time you shared the gospel with anyone? When's the last time you didn't flip to the wrong channel on the radio station? When's the last time that you did decide that, that hey, I want to I dress in a way that is well-pleasing unto God? When, when, when's the last time that you said, I, I want to make sure that, that the companions, the friends that I'm surrounding myself with, they're the right kind of people, and, and I don't want to hang out with the wrong crowd? Those kinds of decisions. We need to monitor our conduct because how we behave really does count. In, in fact, um, in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll read you a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10. You know this, you know this very well. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one, right? Every man and any man, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. God's keeping record. God is judging us. So, so we need to monitor our conduct. Here's, here's a third way that we make sure that we are building with the right materials. We offer our service to God. Here's what I mean by that. God has a gifting and equipping that He has given to all of us. You may not realize that, okay? I think a lot of times we look at what we consider the more premier. You know, like, like God calls people to preach. God's gifted some people to sing. And, and we, you know, we, we look at some of those. God's, God's equipped people to be teachers. And we think like the list stops there. 
but it doesn't. There's so many equippings. There's, there's so many giftings in the church. The, the quote that I read earlier speaks of the gift of being a helper. You know? I mean, like, if you could just help do something where somebody else could focus more on the gifting that they have, guess what you've done? You've helped. You've offered your service to use whatever gifting God has equipped you with. Okay? What do we hear about as far as singing careers? Okay? Uh, the testimony of those folks that made it. Here's, here's what they tip. I don't know the logistics of all of this. I just know it makes me sick when I hear it. You know, these popular pop culture, you know, folks, you know, folks that made it. And, and when they make it big, what are they? They, they do the little, they do the little storyline on them. And they always go back. And I, I got my start singing in the church. But now I'm half naked and covered in tattoos and I do drugs on the side. You know, and, and I, I took the, I took the natural talent that God gave me, and, and instead of using it for His glory, now I'm just channeling and I'm using it for, 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 for whatever, you know, kind of stuff. Now, look, look, instead of you, look, instead of using the abilities God has given to you for, for reasons that are going to perish and be burned up one day, why not, why not use the, the equippings God has placed in your life in His service for His for His glory. So, so remember to be careful how we are building our lives. Let me give you this last one and we'll be finished. Number three this morning. We need to recognize the rightful owner. This is so important. Recognize the rightful owner. Look with me, verse number 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Again, verse 17. If any man defile, we're going to stop right here, defile the temple of God. Do you understand what that terminology means? Like uh, the temple of God. Uh, also, it's used, Paul writing to Timothy, the house of God is, is speaking of the temple as well. Uh, when you say the temple of God, you're saying the, the temple that belongs to God. It's God's temple. If we want to reduce it down, it's God's building. It's a building for God that belongs to God. Okay, like if I was to say, do you want to go to Stanley's house? It's my house, okay? All right, so this is God's house. We're dealing in, in context, not with a building that belongs to me. And we're dealing in context, not with a building that belongs to you, but we're dealing in context with a building that belongs to God. We have to keep this in mind, that, that this project belongs to God. The, in, in fact, the project of our lives, not, not, just, not just a brick, you know, walls. But our lives as believers do not belong to ourselves. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, Paul says we are His workmanship. Like, like we're God's building project. One man said it like this, we're God's work in progress. I like that. I think that thing that really helps to capture. Like I'm, I'm not what I ought to be, but, but God's still working on me kind of mentality. I, I love that. I love that. And, and, but, but it's not my, I'm His building project. I belong to God. And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's God's building, but God's letting me work with Him on its construction. I'm working with Him in the building of this thing. Notice verse number 16. It's real personal. Uh, it's real personal. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Ye are. It's personal. It's not, it's not corporately as much as it is individually. You are the temple of God. The, the temple of God is the building that belongs to God. It is a very important building. I mean, this is God's building. And it is to be built, therefore, according to His specifications. His building code. You know, God, God where, do you, where, do you, where do you say this ought to line up at? Where's, where's the parameter? How far can I go? And when have I gone far enough? And when do I need to bring it back in? How high? How wide? How tall? How everything? God, this is, I mean, you pick the colors. You, you pick the materials going on the wall. Everything, God, your way. If we were playing athletics today, we would say, we got to play by God's rules. If we were talking about the family structure, we would say, God wears the pants. He's the, he's the one calling the shots. He's the one that's in charge. Now, look, look in verse number 17. This is where it gets, I mean, just so important for us. Notice the last usage of the individuality. If any man defile the temple of God, 
And that word defile is so important. It's, it's actually used twice. It shows up the next time in verse 17 as the word destroy uh, tra- uh, translated from the same exact word, same exact word in, in the Greek text. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. It's a play on words. If you defile God's temple, God's going to defile you. Okay? If, you, if you're messing with what belongs to God, God's going to mess with you on this thing. Okay? Uh, again, the temple is so important. The, the temple of God, you understand, in, in Paul's mindset, the temple is the most sacred place in the entire globe. There's nothing, there's not a building more important than the temple. What is the temple? The temple is a place that is dedicated to the glory of Jehovah. I mean, absolutely. Everything, I mean, the building materials, everything had to be according to pattern. Now, there's an event, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, I know some of you are, that took place. Uh, so so you, had, you had the first temple, uh, the, the Solomon's temple, and, and Solomon's temple was destroyed, remember, when the Babylonians sieged Jerusalem. Then you had the rebuilding, the second temple that eventually came known as Herod's temple. That's the temple of the day of Christ. Now, something very interesting happened in the second temple period around 176 B.C. There was a, a ruler, as, as most of you know, Jerusalem and Israel transitioned from you know, being up underneath control from different folks. In 176, there was a man by the name of Antiochus IV. He actually nicknamed himself Epiphanes. Do you know what, you know what Epiphanes means? It, it means like, like the visible manifestation of God. Like if a person says, I had an epiphany, they're saying, I saw a visible manifestation of God. They're saying they ate pizza too late before they went to bed that night. Okay, all right. Uh, so, uh, so Antiochus nicknamed himself Epiphanes. He claimed to be the incarnation of Zeus. Antiochus was a Seleucid ruler who came into Jerusalem in the year 176 B.C., and he, uh, among everything else that he did, he desecrated the temple of God. He, he actually dedicated the temple that was dedicated to the use of Jehovah's glory. He dedicated it in the name of Zeus. And he actually set a statue of Zeus up in the temple there in Jerusalem. And then to really consecrate the whole thing, he took a pig... In, in Jews, in the Jews religion, an unclean animal, and he sacrificed the pig on an altar, committing historically what we have come to know as the abomination of desolation. He desolated the profundity of God's temple. Man, like when you hear that, doesn't that like make your heart bleed a little bit? Like, man, that's so bad. Like the place that is, I mean, the most important building in all the world that's dedicated to the glory of Jehovah. And this guy, among all the other words that I want to use, comes in and does that. I mean, like spitting in the face of God. I mean, saying, I don't care about your, your God. You know, I'm God. I'm, I'm bigger than your God will ever be kind of thing. I mean, the abomination of desolation. What did, what did Antiochus do? He, he defiled the temple of God. You know, it's, it's real easy to stand here today in 2024 and throw stones at a man like that for defiling a physical building. But I wonder how guilty you and I are of doing just as bad to our lives. See, your life, my life, is the temple of God. God's dwelling in my life. In, in fact, he says, verse number 16, he says, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. That's what set the temple apart. God was said to dwell in the innermost uh, sanctum part of, of, the, of the building. And we are the temple of God in the sense that God is dwelling inside of us. But how many times do we take the building, our lives, that is supposed to be dedicated to the glory of God and, and kind of push God to the side and set a statue up ourselves and just defile the temple? In what ways am I defiling the temple of God? In what way? Look, here's, here's, the, here's the major way from our text. What, what would be being said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Here's, here's the way that you and I defile the temple of God by using inferior building materials. If you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that, that God went through great lengths to tell them how big, I mean, how wide, how long, how tall 
and, and what to use, not just in the building itself, but in all of the furniture, the tabernacle and of the temple. I mean, I mean, to, I mean, this long, I mean, I mean, the ark is this high, the, I mean, the, the table of bread, I mean, everything, where it's going to be at, all the dimensions, to deviate from God's plan would have been just as serious of a crime as to sacrifice a pig on the altar. Because it is to break away from God's design of a building that belongs to Him, for Him. That is to be controlled by Him. But there's a promise given, verse number 17. If a man does this, if he defiles the temple of God, what's God going to do to him? God's going to defile him. He's going to destroy him. What, what does it mean? What does it mean that God is going to destroy the person? I, I grew up, and you, and you probably did too, with superficial understandings of this. Like I, I grew up, when I first started preaching, I, I would preach 1 Corinthians three seventeen, and I would tell you, if you were smoking cigarettes, God's going to destroy you <laughs> because you're harming the temple of God. I would, I, and, and then, you know, folks that smoke cigarettes would, uh, would, would come back at me and they would say, they would say, well, you drink Coca Cola's and you're harming the temple of God too because you're putting all that sugar. And I don't know why Coca Cola's so bad. I mean, just because you can pour it on a battery and it eat the the corrosion all from it. I mean, that sucker's cleaning me out. I mean, that's got to be like one of the most helpful drinks that you could possibly put into your system. Ah. Uh. But And we would get into wars like that. And I would have to come to my justification because I won't give up Coca Cola's. I mean, I was as bad as the, as the Marlboro man. You know? I'm like, no, I'm not giving it up. That's not what the Bible's talking about. They're saying that's not what the Bible's talking about. And neither one of us have a leg to stand on. Hey, it's not, it's not talking about what you're putting into your body as far as material things. I'll let you sort out the Marlboro thing and the Coca-Cola thing for yourself today. Okay? Uh, that's, that's, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about you having wrong motives, wrong conduct, and not using the resources God has given to you for His glory and in His service. So if you fail to do those things, the Bible says God is going to destroy you. He's going to judge you. Destroy doesn't have to mean eternal damnation. If you're saved, you're saved. Yet so is by fire. But it does mean that there's a judgment day coming. And by the way, you may not even make it to judgment day until before God judges you. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 5, we read about such destruction. Paul says there was a certain man who was involved in certain sin that he was encouraging to be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand from later on in the same epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that there were individuals who were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. They were building their lives with wood, hay, and stubble. They didn't take it seriously, this thing of worship, right? And so because they didn't take it seriously, God said, some of them have become sick and some of them are actually dead. God judged them because they were defiling the temple of God. God God's basically saying in verse number 17, if you'll be bold enough to build with raw materials, I'll be bold enough to judge you for building with the raw materials. And so be very, very careful about the choices that you're making in your life. I need to be very, very careful about the choices I'm making every day in my life because those choices are determining whether I am building with the proper building materials or I'm building with the wrong building materials. Okay? So we're, we're, we're going to pray here in just a second. Let me, let me just tell you just a few things. Number one, if you're here today and you've never been saved, you need the right foundation in your life. Nothing else matters. If you're not trust Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior, you need the right, the right foundation which alludes to your salvation. And then secondly, after you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you need the right materials in your life. You need to examine your motives. You need to examine your conduct and your service to God and check up with the Lord. And then number three, for all of us, we need the right perspective. And the right perspective is that we belong to God. Our lives belong to God. And so we are to live our lives in the way that God tells us to live, to live our lives. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's stand this morning for prayer.